don't see it. Um, it's still setting it up. Okay. And, and there'll be there'll be a couple second delay. So you just saying I don't see it might actually appear on it. We'll see. Oh, and then the transcripts. I am going to enable auto transcription. So the auto captions are on. If you find them distracting, you have the ability to turn them off for yourself. So under, under transcripts, um, you can hide subtitles under transcripts. And, and I'm hearing myself echoed on YouTube. Um, Yolanda, can you go ahead and mute so that we don't hear the YouTube? That might be me. Ah, I need to close the window. Okay, <laughs> that was me. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone. We're delighted to have you with us. We'll be starting uh, just one more minute. We'll give ourselves one more minute for people to finish joining us, but we're delighted to have all of you with us tonight for Live from LPSC. Um, thank you. If you're having any trouble with the audio, there is a telephone number that you can uh, dial in as well to hear. And uh, for all of our attendees, right now, we do not have the ability for you to share your cameras and your microphones, because that might be a little overwhelming with everyone, with all of our panelists and speakers for tonight. However, you are welcome to answer, enter questions and comments in the chat. We um, do have uh, closed captioning turned on. If the closed captioning is distracting, there's a little button that you can pick to, to hide subtitles that uh, to reduce that for yourself. We are live streaming from the YouTube, LPI's YouTube site, and uh, we are also recording this. So fair warning for everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Christine Schupla. I'm the Education and Public Engagement Manager at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. We have a marvelous team with us tonight. Um, Sherelle, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. And while you're moving to the next slide, Sherelle, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Sherelle Webb. I'm the phenomenal education specialist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Self-honored. Thank you, everyone, for being here and joining us tonight. And with us tonight, Yolanda is monitoring our, our YouTube live site. Yolanda, please introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. So glad to have you here tonight here at our LPSC 52. I'm Yolanda Ballard, and I will be assisting in the backgrounds today on the YouTube channel and uh, checking the chat boxes. Thank you for joining. And about and, and I will have our speaker and our panelists introducing themselves momentarily. But before we get to that, just to let everyone know a little bit more about LPSC, you might be wondering, why am I joining live from LPSC? LPSC is not in person this year. <laughs> it is virtual. But um, all of our speakers, all of us are participating in it this year. And the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, it's held annually in March, jointly by LPI and by NASA Johnson Space Center. And we have specialists from around the world in petrology, geochemistry, geophysics, geology, astronomy. Um, this left off astrobiology, I, should, I need to update that. Astrobiology, it left, it left off a few other specialties as well. There's just so many awesome people that are presenting their research. Uh, and there's a couple of websites there. Um, and um, Sherelle, um, could you go ahead and copy, will it let you, it might not. If it'll let you paste those websites in the chat, let's do that. It might not, and if it doesn't, then we will do that in just a few minutes. And, uh, and yes, you, you're welcome to go on to the next slide. So tonight, here's what we've got planned for you all. Um, we're going to do our introductions. We've got a, a short presentation by Dr. Uliana Gross about the new research from the recently opened Apollo Lunar Core Samples. Yay! And then um, our panelists are going to participate in discussion about how the conference has been going today, what they've learned, what's exciting about them, and answer your questions. Uh, for all of you, please do enter your thoughts in the chat and your questions 
questions for the speaker and the panelists in the Q&A. If you keep those separately, that way we won't miss anyone's questions. So that'll make it a little bit easier. And um, when you're entering things in the chat, please do select all panelists and attendees so everyone else can see everything you're entering in the chat as well. We want this to be interactive. We want you to feel comfortable joining us for this discussion. So please do enter those things. And um, let's go ahead and move along to the next slide and let's it, have our speakers introduce themselves. So for tonight's panelists, um, Dr. Uliana Gross, uh, Juliana, please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Juliana Gross, and I'm the NASA Deputy Apollo um, Curator here at Johnson Space Center. And I'm also um, a professor for planetary sciences at Rutgers University, but I'm currently on leave, so I can, I can help NASA uh, with the ENXA program. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight. Thank you. And Mache, please introduce yourself. Absolutely. So my name is Mache Aaron. I am a third year PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I study um, carbon barren and sulfate minerals on Mars and specifically Martian craters. And I primarily do my research at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in, in, Laurel, in Laurel, Maryland. Thank you so much. Zillard, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Silad. I am a fourth year PhD candidate at UC Santa Cruz, as it says on the slide. And the stuff I work on uh, these days tends to be the satellites of large, of the large outer planets. Uh, at LPSC, I'm presenting about Io, but in the past, I've done some of Saturn's moons. I've also dabbled with Mars and the moon on, and our moon on occasion, but focusing on the little guys for now. Awesome, thank you. And Gavin, please introduce yourself. Yeah, so uh, hello, uh, my name's Gavin. I'm a PhD candidate at Western University in Canada. Uh, a lot of my research involves using radar remote sensing to study terrestrial lava flows that have uh, surfaces that are similar to lunar and Martian lava flows. So we can try and get a better understanding of how they were probably in place uh, millions of years ago. And uh, I do a little bit of stuff on impact cratering as well. You're looking at high temperature minerals that form when a meteorite would strike the surface of a planet. So yeah, I'm very excited to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and I am going to uh, go ahead and add questions for all of you who are attending us right now. Tell us a little bit more about you. What's your background and interest in planetary science? So. Um, so for all of our attendees, the panelists, you're welcome to vote as well. We do have some additional panelists who are with us who are going to also be joining us later in the week. You are welcome to jump in with answers and thoughts, but I'm gonna focus predominantly on these folks for right now, so. And I'm gonna give everyone about five more seconds to finish voting. Five, four, three, two, and one. Awesome. So we've got a, a big variety of, of people with us tonight. Some of you are very curious about planetary science. Some of you who, who would like to know more, enjoy learning about the solar system, you might be studying planetary science. Uh, you might be a solar system or an amateur astronomer. Uh, and several of you are planetary scientists. So yay! Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, let's go ahead and what we're going to do now is, um, Juliana, we're gonna go ahead and get you started. Um, so Sherelle, let's go ahead and stop sharing this PowerPoint. And, um, and while we're here, I will let everyone know that we've got a few other people who are gonna be joining us later this week. Um, Martin, would you mind taking just a second to introduce yourself? I think you're on. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Martin Hajansky. I'm. This is my fourth year to be a microblogger at the LPSC, and uh, I'm even including last year because why not? You know. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I'm looking forward to talking on Thursday night. Thank you, and Nandita, um, you're going to be joining us later as well. Would you mind introducing yourself too? Uh, not at all. Hi, everyone. I'm Nandita. I am a second year PhD student at Stony Brook University, and I study space weathering on airless bodies, uh, including moon and other airless bodies. Uh, 
and I'm look, really looking forward to this tomorrow and today. Thank you so much. So, can't um, let's see. Can everyone see? No, probably not. You probably can't see that because I haven't told it to share. Let me share it. Okay. So, um, you can probably, hopefully, now see the presentation. Yes, ma'am. Juliana. Great. You're welcome yes. to get started. Awesome, thank you. And thank you so much for, for handling the slides. I really appreciate that. All right, well, um, hello everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun and I am going to tell you a little bit about the ANGSA program um, that we're pre uh, presenting here at LPSC and that stands for um, Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis. And I'm gonna explain a little bit how ANGSA helps us connect our past, which was Apollo, with our future, which is gonna be Artemis. All right, so if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so when the astronauts brought back samples about 50 years ago, NASA had the good foresight to keep some of these samples unopened because they knew that technology will evolve with time and they really wanted to keep some of the um, moon rocks safe and undisturbed for the next generation of lunar scientists to study. And so now almost 50 years later, this future vision of NASA has basically become our reality today, and especially this week when we're starting to present the first results. And so Lunar Core 73002 was the first INSA sample that got opened, and you can see a panorama picture here um, of the Apollo 17 Station 3 site, and the big arrow um, is pointing to where that sample was taken. All right, let's do the next slide, please. Okay, so I already sort of said it that the uh, ANGSA sample is a core sample, and that means that the astronauts basically took a hollow tube and then hammered and drove it into the ground, and that's why we call it a drive tube, and you can see the astronaut on the right doing that um, to that particular sample. And then the hollow part of the tube fills with rocks and soil, um, and that is important because that way we may we might be able to um, observe different layers uh, of the moon that might exist underneath the surface that we can't see otherwise. And though the image on the left is what the drive tube looks like. It has an upper part and a lower part. And if we go to the next slide, the arrow in here points to sample 73002, which is the upper part of this double drive tube. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, all right, so in November 2019, we opened this particular upper part of that drive tube, sample 73002. And so here are a couple of images of the day that we opened the sample. Um, it was super exciting, and we were three women who actually got to do this. And so on the upper uh, left image, the, um, Andrea Mosi is on the, on the right side. You can see, yep, right there. And then Cherise Kreischer is in the foreground to the left, and then I'm in the background on, in the left. And so we were the three women who got to open the actual sample. Um, we, did, we trained a lot. There were a lot of procedures. You can see that in the pictures. We were very focused. And then on the lower left, you can see some of the NASA folks um, basically looking into the clean lab. You can see that, that we are all dressed in these white bunny suits. Um, and there's a window so people can see what we're doing. And then the lower right image is right after we had extruded, successfully extruded the sample. And, and we were just so relieved and you can sort of see that on our facial expressions. We were slightly terrified, but also very happy. Um, all right, so next slide. So before we actually opened the core sample, we scanned the core with a technology called X-ray computed tomography or short XCT scanning. And that technology didn't quite exist like this 50 years ago. So XCT scanning today is usually used on humans in medicine to take 3D pictures of the inside of your body, um, like taking a picture of your brain without actually opening your head. Um, so, that, so that's very useful. Um, and we can do the same thing now with rocks. And so on the left is a picture of the core that was taken in 1974 with a, a typical 2D X-ray machine, similar to if you go to the doctor today and they, they scan your arm for broken bones. So that's what was done in 1974. And then in the middle, you can see the image um, that we took with the XCT scan in 2019. And you can see how different the quality really is. And then on the, on the right side, I have a little movie. And let's see if we can get that to work. Um, so we can take the data and then create three-dimensional movies with that. And we can really see all the different parts 
uh, that are inside this drive tube, all the different rock fragments, without actually opening the sample. And so that, will, that helps us to anticipate any problems that we might encounter. Um, also makes us very excited to actually open the sample. Um, and so this is an example of how technology has evolved over time. And this is exactly why NASA had the foresight to keep um, some of these samples safe and unopened so that the next generation of lunar scientists can use this new technology to extract more and better information about the moon from these samples. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so once we pushed the core out, um, it was sitting on this table and I, I marked uh, where the surface is and where it goes into, into depth. And so then we start taking the core apart bit by bit and you, um, can see the white lines represent a five millimeter interval. And so we're taking the core apart by five millimeter um, uh, uh, intervals. And we do this in, in such small increments because we wanna make sure that we capture any potential changes in the core, like color changes. And you can see on the right side where the surface of the moon is, it's a lot darker than the rest of the core, right? Um, and we also do this so that we can extract all the little fragments of rocks that are in the core. And you can see the upper um, left image where we have sorted them in different size fractions. And now if we go to the next slide, the cool part about the um, XCT scanning is that it has evolved so much that we can not only scan our large core samples, but we can also scan teeny, teeny, tiny pieces of material like this four millimeter size rock fragment. And that will help us to look on the inside of the rock and see the inside structure without actually breaking it or contaminating it, because that's a big issue. We don't want to contaminate any of these samples. Um, so the different grayscales in this color represent different minerals and the different chemistry of minerals. And minerals um, in general record the conditions of their formation. And so this is a piece of basalt, which is super exciting because basalt is an igneous rock. And that means it crystallized directly from a melt like a ma in a magma chamber or in a lava flow that has been produced by volcanism. And so that lava or the magma usually comes from the inside of the moon. And now if we analyze these minerals, we then uh, learn about the conditions of the inside of the moon, like temperature and pressure, the chemistry, the potential oxygen environment. And all this information that we're gathering from the core and these rock fragments will then ultimately help us to better understand how the moon formed uh, and evolved through space and time. And if we go to the last slide. So with the ANXA program, um, we can now learn how to better prepare for our future for Artemis. Um, Artemis will land the first woman and the next man near the moon's south pole, somewhere between mid to late 2020s. And Artemis will bring back cold samples and sealed samples. And that is exactly the type of sample that the ANXA program is dealing with. And so by doing the ANGSA program, we can now learn what tools are good for collecting the samples um, with Artemis, how to maybe create better sample containers, um, how to best store these precious samples and preserve them once they have been returned to Earth. And so this is really just the beginning. Uh, we have just opened the first, the first part of the drive tube. Hopefully later this year, we'll uh, open the second part. Um, and so there's going to be a lot more to come in the future. And with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions, should there be any. Thank you so much. So folks, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start with questions for Dr. Gross about ANGSA and, and this process and, and the Apollo samples. And then we'll continue on with the discussion from by all of our panelists. So. Um, I already see a question um, from Bill. What are the two types of samples that Artemis will return? Um, so it hasn't quite been decided what samples exactly they're going to return, but we definitely would like to have cold samples return. So on the South Pole, there are areas uh, in craters that never see sunlight. And so they're extremely, extremely cold. And so all um, potential um, volatiles like water uh, gets trapped there in the form of ices. And so if the astronauts manage to get a cold sample, we want to make sure that they're frozen and that we keep them frozen when we return them to Earth. And so that would give us information about what type of volatiles, or what type of water or carbon dioxide actually exists on the moon and where. Um, and then the other type we are hoping are core samples, just like the one I showed you for ANGSA, where we can basically drill onto the inside of the the moon and see different layers underneath the surface. 
But then we also would like samples to be returned um, that are sitting on the surface, like like big rock type samples, like we call these hand samples. And so it really depends on your scientific question that you want to answer. Um, and a lot of a lot of scientists and people are working together to figure out what kind of questions we should ask and what type of samples are necessary to collect these. Um, and so hopefully it's going to be a lot of samples, not just two. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we've got another question here. Are there more samples being saved for opening in the future? Mm -hmm. For example, 100 years after Apollo? Or <laughs> so um, yeah, so there are, there's another um, sealed sample um, from Apollo 16 that is not going to be open yet. So we're opening the Apollo 17 samples. And then there are a few samples that have been stored under special conditions. Uh, like uh, they are, they have been stored frozen, and so we are opening a subset of these samples. But um, a, another subset of these samples will definitely be preserved for the future. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, we're going to do the next uh, question or two, and then after that, we're going to open it up for panel discussion on not just this, but everything else that's been going on today. So, um, uh, were there any surprises in this sample from this Apollo site as compared to other Apollo sites? Were there any major differences from other Apollo sites? Um, that's a really good question. So one thing that we noticed is that this particular core is extremely friable. So when, when we talk to other lunar processors that have worked on other um, Apollo samples before, especially core samples, they have told us that um, once you extrude them and you start dissecting them, they just really they really hold their shape. Um, with this particular sample, it's just it's just collapsing and avalanching and it's giving us a little bit of a hard time. Um, and that could be that because when the sample was taken by the astronauts, um, before they were able to put the cap on at the bottom, part of the sample fell out. Um, and so that was a void space. And, and so we think what happened is the void space sort of got mixed into it and maybe made the core a little bit more friable, which makes it harder for us to dissect it very carefully. Um, the, the dark gray area that I showed you um, at the surface um, was maybe not super surprised, but um, for us personally, it was a little bit because we think that is due to space weathering and we can we can really see how the properties of the, the soil get changed due to um, bombardment uh, of x-rays onto the surface. And so that's just really neat to see, you know, in front of you. Awesome. Okay, so last question for right now before we go to panel discussion, and, and we'll come back to the others. Is it possible to recreate experiments on Earth with simulants before we use the moon samples? So mineral simulants or something. Yeah, yeah, so there's a simulant called JSC-1, I think, um, that people use for all sorts of experiments. Um, and this is often done so that they can calibrate the instruments or try out techniques before they then actually apply to get lunar soil or regolith to to carry out the actual research and so we always like um when scientists you know do sort of their homework and test everything out and and, and make sure that the techniques really work well before before they get precious samples because once you destroy them or you contaminate them you know they, they're gone and and you know we don't have that much <laughs> so yes simulant is a good thing awesome okay so now for everyone that's here um, what did you hear today that was really exciting for you? What's, what's new? What's interesting? Um, what are people working on that you thought was just amazing that you would like to talk about? And who would like to go first? I'm going to pick on Mache. <laughs> Um, so one talk that I went to was during the, I think it was during the, um, yeah, it was the um, impacts um, crater formation small to large um, session. And there was this one talk about complex crater formation by oblique impacts on the earth and moon. And for those of you who don't know what um, complex craters are and oblique craters, so complex craters, um, it kind of depends on what planet you're on, but they're basically um, craters that have a central peak, a, cent a central peak. And um, the reason why I say it depends on the plan that you're on is because um, um, the criteria for what a complex crater is um, depends on the gravity of the body that you're on. So for Earth, it's pretty easy because we got plenty of gravity. Um, we can get a complex crater at two kilometers, but on the moon, it takes 20 kilometers. A crater that's 20 kilometers will have that central peak. Um, but the other definition is the oblique um, impacts. And oblique impacts are, I think, are the most interesting 
of the types of impacts because they're just impactors that come in at a very steep angle. So um, if you ever pull up a photo of um, oblique impacts, you'll see that they have like these ejected that looks like butterfly wings. Kind of like if you were to like um, run your hand against water and you can see that it just spreads to the side. So yeah, um, back to the, um, the talk. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, one, because I never, I don't know why I never thought of this, but I never thought that oblique impacts could create complex craters. I thought they would just create just these weird oblong craters and there would not be a central peak. Um, but um, Tom Davison from Impacts and um, Astral Materials Research Center, which is actually a really cool organization, um, created the simulation where they try to um, um, create these um, um, complex craters from these oblique impacts. And I'm trying to remember what happened at the end, but ultimately, um, uh, well, obviously um, oblique craters would make much larger impacts, but um, with regards to comparing it with Earth versus you know, the moon, um, I'm trying to think. <sighs> Sorry, I can't remember the conclusion. I just remember being really excited about learning all the, the bits and pieces of it. Um, but so you were surprised at the at their results that 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 these impacts that were coming in from a low angle actually weren't just oval craters. There was there were differences that you weren't expecting. Well, they were creating oval oval craters, but they were creating complex craters and with um, a central peak and with features. With a central peak, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected that either. So yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. Zillard, what did you hear today that you thought was interesting or awesome or amazing? Um, there are a couple exciting talks. Um, I guess uh, one that caught my eye was in, uh, there was a ocean worlds and or active worlds session. Um, and they were looking at Pluto. This was um, by Adine Denton. Uh, I believe she's a PhD student at uh, Purdue. I could be wrong. I'm sorry, Adine. Um, but she was looking at Pluto and how, if you look at Pluto, uh, hopefully everyone's seen the pictures from the flyby a couple of years ago. There's that big heart right in the center of Pluto. And part of that heart is a big impact basin. And it's kind of ellipsoidal. So going on with the oblique impacts, as mentioned earlier, but this one's for Pluto. And on the exact opposite side of Pluto, there's some funky terrain. And the theory goes that maybe this impact somehow made that terrain just by the seismic waves traveling through Pluto. So she put together a bunch of computer simulations to see, depending on the interior of Pluto, what would the terrain on the opposite side look like? And it turns out, in these models at least, to recreate the terrain at the other end of this big impact on Pluto, you would need a thick ocean underneath the crust of Pluto. And then the core of Pluto would have to be hydrated, which just means there's a lot of water rock interaction and the rock within the core has also been aqueously altered. Just fancy way of saying you threw water at your minerals. And this is exciting because if there's a lot of water rock interaction, then that increases the potential habitability of this Pluto subsurface ocean, which if you asked anyone like five, 10 years ago, no one would have expected any chance of habitability at Pluto. But now we're like, oh, we're thinking there's an ocean here. And now we're thinking it might be thick. And now we're thinking there might be rock interaction. Um, I think they still maybe have a bit of work to do just to work out any potential complications, but I think it looks promising. Uh, so that was, that was just one talk, but I'll let someone else talk before I blab everyone's ears off. Cool, very cool. <laughs> Gavin, what did you see or hear today that you thought was particularly interesting? Uh, well, for me, it was actually probably the first talk I attended um, today. And um, it was presented by, I think it was um, Sierra uh, Hamid, um, I think she's a PhD student at the Arizona State University. 
and she was looking at understanding the complex magnetic history of the moon. And this is something I, I didn't know. I, I do study the moon, but I don't know a lot about its uh, magnetic history. So this was all very new to me. And she, she was saying that looking at remote sensing data and records of the paleomagnetic field, which just means the an older magnetic field of the moon trapped recorded inside uh, Apollo rocks, was saying that the moon's magnetic field is actually quite strong when it first formed. Uh, probably, I think it was still weaker compared to Earth's because of size differences, but for the moon, it was still pretty strong. And then started to deteriorate and weaken about 3.7 billion years ago, and then about a billion years ago, it got the strength that we see today from remote sensing data. And I think up to then, a lot of um, theories saying like, well, the moon probably just had a core like system that generated magnetic field like Earth does. But apparently the high intensities of the magnetic field in the past that she was recording, a core d dynamo can't explain that at all. So she was like proposing a new, well, she was reproposing a concept where they think a magma ocean that was in between the core and the mantle formed when the moon was first created. And then that was able to, and it was rich in probably iron and titanium. And that's usually how you can generate a magnetic field through um, uh, convection systems in molten rock. And she thinks like it started off like that and it had enough energy to generate that strong magnetic field in the past. And then as time passed, it slowly crystallized. So then it, the convection cells started to deteriorate. So then the magnetic field weakened until eventually all that heat just dissipated into the core. And then that started to jumpstart sort of like a core a dynamo effect, which then explains the weak field that we see today. So I just found it was very interesting to see, to hear that the moon had that much of a complex or potentially that much of a complex um, magnetic history and what it could actually tell us that happened within our own natural satellite compared, because we're so used to what our own planet's doing, but we still know little about what's happening on our own, very own moon, let alone any other planetary body. Yeah. Uh, to add to that, there was also a talk right after that. I didn't attend the session, but I did see the pre-recorded talk. That was a completely different theory for how to explain this paleomagnetic signature. And I see uh, Nadita nodding. Uh, I know she does moon stuff, so I'm sure she's excited. I kind of attended that talk right before attending this talk. And I was like, <laughs> okay, this is going to be cool. Uh, I missed out <laughs> on the uh, discussion session. I like, I don't know. I, I think I had to attend some other session or some, some other talk. But yeah, it would have been really interesting to bring them both and be like, okay, now what do you say? You both have like very different theories for like, you know, uh, changing lunar magnetism. So uh, I think this was from Sonia Tiku's group in Stanford. Um, they, uh, I think it was she, uh, or I, I don't want to presume. They were talking about uh, uh, they were talking about how uh, you cannot like uh, you know say that the magnetism of moon was all due to uh, changing lunar dynamo, but rather uh, something similar to I think Mars that is change in the uh, fluid motion altogether, not Mars, rather Earth change in the direction of the uh, convection itself over time. So yeah, that's what like their proposal was. And uh, that was pretty interesting. Yes, <laughs> two very different hypotheses for to explain the changing mag uh, magnetism on moon. That's I guess pretty... I have a, a question about that. I, I guess I'm not too well versed about how um, a magnetic field can be created, um, but I always just imagine that you had to be a certain size um, in order for you to um, induce a magnetic field. I think that's partially true. Um, I think that definitely has to do with how long your field can last, just because if you're bigger and a lot of time it has to do with how fast you're spinning, I think, then you can maintain that field for longer. But I think as long as you have a conductive fluid layer, like a fluid core, then if it's convecting, then you could have mag ah, mag magnetism. Um, it's just with the moon, as I'm sure you know, it's a very small core, so it wasn't expected to last long. Uh, but I guess these theories are now saying could last long, just be real weak sauce. Which kind of reminds me. So yeah, an additional thing now that we are talking about magnetism was uh, that was mentioned in the other talk, not the one that Kevin discussed was. So one uh, very 
widely accepted hypothesis is uh, giant impacts have also led to loss of magnetism on like different planetary bodies, including Mars and Moon. And so, yeah, uh, her talk is kind of titled about how impacts uh, like, you know, shock demagnetization cannot explain uh, the variation that we see in magnetic field of moon over time. Uh, so, yeah. And then like she talks about how changing uh, change in the direction of uh, a periodic change in the direction of convection currents within the core could better explain it than uh, straight away shock, de shock demagnetization or, you know, uh, a code that eventually stopped uh, being fluid and, and moving more or less. Very cool. We have a couple of questions. Um, and let's see, the first one here I'm going to hit um, for, uh, is about um, uh, about the samples again, uh, about ANXA. Um, have the samples been analyzed in the past and th did they match basalt too? Was one of the um, questions here. So, so yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, scientists have analyzed Apollo samples in general in, in the past, basically since they have been returned. Um, for the specific ANXA samples, um, we just started analyzing these, um, but we have in the Apollo collection basalt samples, similar to what we think we have found um, in the ANXA samples. We have found a few rock fragments that have a texture that we have not necessarily seen in the way that we see them right now. And so we have a few fragments and fragments that we're not quite sure what, what the rock types really are and whether we have those particular types in the sample collection. Um, and so that's something we're still trying to figure out. Um, as I said, these are non-destructive methods. And so, you know, we're basically just imaging through and looking at it. And so now the next step is to actually take these rock fragments um, and, then, and then cut them and stick them in an electron microprobe, for example, or any other instrument where we can then extract the chemistry of the mineral grains to then get more information about um, the bulk composition and where they really come from. Um, and that, that the ANGSA scientists and the team members, um, they get to do all of this fun stuff. And so then we can directly compare those basalt fragments we found in the ANGSA core to the other basalt fragments we have in the, in the Apollo collection and also in our meteorite collection. Great, awesome. Martin, you had an interesting question. I thought maybe I'd ask you to go ahead and bring that up live for everyone to discuss. Thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was a similar effort to cache samples from OSIRIS-REx as well as from eventual Mars sample return or Artemis. If there's a plan in place to do anything similar for a, for a long longitudinal study like this. So I, I can make a start, maybe. Um, so the ANGSA program is definitely going to um, be useful for the OSIRIS-REx mission as well, especially what we're doing right now, the preliminary examination and all the all the lessons learned, good and bad, um, you know, the OSIRIS-REx scientists can then take those lessons and maybe, uh, you know, refine the process or the program of how to deal with the samples. Um, they're going to be a little bit different because they're from a different planetary body. Um, but hopefully some part of it is also going to be XCT scan just because it's a really powerful tool that we can utilize before actually opening the samples or contaminating of any kind. Um, and so hopefully that that the lessons we learn with the ANGSA program can then be um, used forward for other sample return missions, including OSIRIS-REx, um, potentially the Mars sample return as well. And the nice thing about ANGSA is that it's a pretty big team and it's handled as a sample return mission, just because it's the, the first Apollo sample that hasn't been opened in re a really long time. And it's a, it's a collaboration between scientists that have been around for a really long time that were even there during the Apollo era. And then the next generation of scientists like us and who have not been born you know, during the time when Apollo happened. And so we really get to learn from each other and um, that makes it really, really exciting. And I think that is a good, um, good program that can be used forward for other sample return missions. Going to open this up for everybody else. <laughs> Anyone want to add to that? And I see Alan Jay, you've got your hand up. Do you want to talk? I'm going to allow you to talk in case there's something you want to add or say. Um. Uh, yes, I, I know that we've uh, taken uh, some very shallow samples from the uh, Apollo sites, but when we do eventually return to the moon uh, and we're able to take uh, deeper samples, what do you think the differences are going to be? Um, 
particularly when we go with Artemis back, um, because we're going to be somewhere in the South Pole region, I think we're going to find, um, hopefully, a lot more ices and, and frozen frozen volatiles in those samples. And so it really becomes a question of how can we best uh, contain these samples so that we are not losing science while we're trying to bring them back to Earth. And so I think that's going to be interesting. Also, the Apollo samples uh, were all taken on the near side, and the near side has been contaminated with this CREEP component, which stands for potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphor. Whoever came up with that acronym should get an award, by the way, because all those samples are creepy. The, the South Pole is not. And so we probably will find a whole different set of samples that are not contaminated. Um, and so the Apollo samples are not representative for the entire moon. And if we go to the South Pole, we hopefully get some more representative samples so we can learn about processes that are, that are planetary altering or you know the evolution of the entire, entire moon. Um, there's very little basalt in that region, so that's also a different difference. Thank you. So does anyone that's on with us right now have any other thoughts about anything that's been said yet or something new that's come to mind that you wanted to talk about? Um, uh, I guess there's something new. Um, there was something else I, I quite liked about this morning mm -hmm. was um, I, I got to the session late. Unfortunately, I was covering another uh, Luna session, but it was the, and I love the title for it, Shaken and Stirred uh, session on um, outer moons and um, planetary bodies. I thought that was a, an amazing title that really represented it because I've started to get more into wanting to learn more about the volcanism on Io in particular. It's it's not part of my research. I just generally I'm interested in it. So I love that there were a lot more talks on all these other planetary uh, bodies and moons because it's just that I, I just feel like those bodies like Io, Europa, Enceladus, Pl Pluto, and the moons of Neptune and Uranus don't get as much attention. I, I know it's mainly just because we don't have a lot of data on them, so we can only say so much uh, based on uh, pure evidence. But it was really nice to learn a bit more about what the interiors and the geological processes were like of these um, bodies. And uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to quickly bring that up because I thought it was a very interesting session. And I'm going to jump in for one second because I think Gavin um, um, touched on something really important. Like LPC is always extremely fun because you get to learn about things that you normally don't do or that are not part of your research. And so, you know, as, as you said, if you're interested in, in outer planets or or something else, Mars, if you you know if you're just a moon person and you're like, oh, I want to learn about Mars, or hey, I want to learn about Osiris Rex and, and the sample return mission, LPC is like the best place to just go and like you know, have your brain filled with all these cool facts and, and new research. Um, and and unfortunately, you know, it's virtual this year, but normally when we're all there in person, everybody's out in the hallways and talking and and making contact. And, and that's really the fun part about LPC um, is learning new things, things that you normally don't, don't get to hear or see. Absolutely. I think we're kind of missing that, but I hope that we'll get some of that in the chat and then some of the, the online networking options. But yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question here. How many Apollo samples are left to open that haven't been opened yet? Um, well, 73001 has not been opened yet, <laughs> which is the next one we're, we're, we're hoping to open. There's an Apollo uh, 16 sample um, that has not been opened and an Apollo 15 sample that hasn't been opened yet. And I think those two will stay closed for a while. Um, who knows for how long? Um, and then there are a, a couple uh, subsets of these frozen samples, as I said. Uh, we're opening only a few. And then there are two um, sets of samples, I think, from Apollo 15 that have been stored in helium atmosphere rather than in nitrogen atmosphere. Um, and so so they will a subset of those samples will also be opened to compare how helium stored samples behave compared to nitrogen stored samples. And so there, yeah, there's still a few unopened and two of them at least will stay closed for a while. Thank you, thank you. Do any of our attendees have questions about any of the other subjects that our panelists have brought up tonight? Um, if you do, please feel free to either raise your hand or to enter it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, we'd love to hear those. 
And while we're waiting for people to add extra questions, my next question for all of our panelists, what's coming up this week that you are really excited about that you can't wait for it to happen? You can't wait to hear what's coming Thanks up. up. Thanks, <laughs> <Exa> session. <laughs> okay. Thanks, <laughs> session. What Anything else? Anything related to Venus. Anything related to Venus. I can't look forward. Like, I, I can't wait to look forward to the first results from Perseverance. There will be live sessions for it. And yeah, I'm really, really, really looking forward to that. Me too. Yeah, and I'm super of, excited about that too. You know, one of the things I'm looking forward to is actually is in a few days is the, uh, the Arecibo uh, look back, the retrospective mm -hmm. on Arecibo later on this week. Because I remember two years ago at LPSC, there was a kind of a post-mortem for opportunity. And that was, it was fantastic. It was a wonderful meeting and it really allowed people to talk a lot about what they did and how they were part of it and the ongoing legacy of opportunity, which I think Arecibo's ongoing legacy is unwritten. So I think there's a lot to be, a lot to be done there. And I think it's gonna be a fantastic talk. No, but I, I also am a big fan for the Venus sessions that are coming up. Uh, I always get, I never get to see enough of them. And it's always quite exciting to see uh, quite a few. And also a uh, cliche for me and anyone who knows me, uh, lunar volcanism sessions, they're always going to be an exciting one for me because um, I only focus on one particular type. So I never get to really learn about the rest of them. So it's always fun to catch up and see what research has been conducted. Uh, now that Gavin mentions and and like uh, we have Angsa expert here, definitely looking forward to the special session of South Pole. And I also have a poster, guys. So uh, really, really looking forward to that and what the community is planning to get from South Pole and you know what what kind of samples were and and everything else. Uh, that would be fun. <laughs> Absolutely, I totally agree with that. Yeah. So I've got a poll question for all of our participants and our panelists can join as well if you'd like. And Venus got left off. It, it wouldn't give me enough. <laughs> it wouldn't give me enough things. I'm so sorry for anyone who has another favorite topic, another favorite object that got left off of this. Please enter it in the chat. What is your favorite object in the solar system that you enjoy either learning about or studying or, you know, so I'm going to give everyone five more seconds to finish voting. We'll see which subject wins. <laughs> I meteorites were on here. <laughs> yeah, I should have added meteorites. If meteorites is your favorite, uh, go ahead and put down asteroid, I guess, or just enter meteorites in the chat. And Gavin's got Io and Venus, yes. And what else? Five, four, three, two, one, and well, um, Europa and Enceladus and the moon and Mars, of course, are all very, very popular objects in the solar system. But yeah, I left off Venus and I shouldn't have. And uh, comets oh, didn't and get any. Nobody liked comets. Oh, <laughs> I like comets just because it does not get any, any votes. It gets mine. <laughs> I'm um, a bit disappointed moon was in the highest voted thing. <laughs> I mean, I, I voted Moon, but my favorite actually wasn't on there, so I had to vote for my second favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question here about Pluto. Uh, do, do any of you, can any of you comment about the ammonia on Pluto and other worlds and what it might be like, what, what life might be like with 30% ammonia? Does anyone um, want to comment on that? Anyone here uh, feel comfortable commenting on that? And if not here, if any of those of you who are joining us as attendees would like to comment on it, uh, raise your hand and I'll, I'll either promote you or I'll just let you talk, your choice. Oh, can any, anyone want to talk about ammonia at Pluto and other worlds and what life might be like with 30% ammonia? I can give like half a jab in the general direction of the answer. I'm going to have a heavy disclaimer that I don't do chemistry. I don't know anything, but I've attended quite a few uh, LPSC talks in my day. Um, and I know that ammonia is generally, at least in ocean worlds, thought of as sort of an antifreeze, so like lower temperature at which a subsurface ocean could exist. Um, I think the biggest limiter for how it might affect life is if life was there in the first place, and that relies on other stuff. So I mentioned earlier with uh, Pluto and the exciting thing being that maybe there's water rock interaction. And that's 
one of the issues people are running into with some ocean worlds is that some of them are so big that the water inside will reach enough pressure at depth to freeze into a higher high pressure phase ice. So then you have sort of an ocean sandwich between two layers of ice before it hits the rock. And that prevents volcanism from getting any minerals or anything interesting into the water. And you just have maybe a saltwater ocean, which isn't very conducive to life without nutrients, basically. Um, so as long as that stuff is there, I guess I'm not pessimistic about life. I assume that if there's the, there's all the other things life needs, then it would evolve to survive with ammonia. Like we have plenty of extremophiles on earth that can survive in all sorts of hells. So I'd say the limiter is other things. But again, I don't know anything. <laughs> well, I think anyone who claims to be an expert on ammonia-based life might be stretching it a little bit, <laughs> but. I mean, I have, I mean, I do not know chemistry at all. Last time I took a chemistry course was during the first semester of my second year of my undergrad, and that's long gone now. Um, and I don't know too much about ammonia. I just know about ammonia ice is actually present on Pluto. I think that's as much as my knowledge goes. I would like to shamelessly plug a talk that might be able to give you a better idea of what nitrogen's role on Pluto is probably like now and in its past. Um, it's a lab and fr main friend of mine, uh, uh, Josh Hedgepath. He has a talk at 11.20 a.m. Central Time on Thursday. Uh, the session is Surface Atmosphere Interactions on Icy Worlds. So I think if you go to that session, you'll get to get, get a better idea of like what ammonia's role is like on the surface of Pluto. And I don't know if it'll help answer your question, but it might give you a better idea of how ammonia behaves on Pluto. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few other comments that have been added here I wanted to, to bring up and a couple more questions before we're out of time. So um, uh, first, uh, in response, Lori, thank you for the question. These LPSC live talks are being recorded and these recordings will be made available. We're going to clean them up in terms of the sound quality and, uh, you know, a little bit of light editing. But because it's streaming right now on YouTube, on LPI's YouTube channel, you can watch that now live and that recording the rough edit will continue to be available until we replace it with a better one. So yes, they'll all be available. Um, there was uh, a comment about having how we have bacteria at high ammonia now. So wow, that's that's oh, wow. Um, Alan had commented that um, that he's looking forward to uh, the lunar Chang'e reports from China. And the, of course, the Mars 2020 initial reports. Thank you, Alan. And then, um, and uh, Alan, do you want to comment on your interstellar comets comment? Is that your favorite object in the solar system? Because <laughs> uh, <coughs> they are pretty remarkable. Um, we've got um, another two questions, though. And so, Alan, if you want me to promote you, you let me know. Um, uh, the two comments here um, are questions. Does anyone know whether there's frozen ammonia on the moon and Mercury? Uh, I'll try to answer it. Uh, so from remote sensing perspective, again, I, I, I don't do like much of sample science. Uh, from remote sensing perspective, we have not detected anything like that. But again, uh, when we talk about south polar region of moon, there are certain regions that uh, Dr. Yulian already talked about called permanently shadowed regions. And they have remained in shadow for billions of years. So they might, and they are like stable, like their temperature is stable enough to like host ammonia ice. That does not say that they will be there, but they are stable enough to host them. And I think that's that pretty much applies to mercury as well. They also have PSRs on the poles. Uh, I, I think Dr. Gross, if she wants to like, I don't know, add on to it, then uh, she can. You did, a great, you, you did a fantastic job. That's exactly what I would have said. Well done. You're right. I, <laughs> Alan, um, please uh, say something. Join us. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I put down the interstellar comets as a, a really cool thing. Um, we've actually had two in the last couple of years uh, that have been from outside the solar system and passed through. And one of them has a nearly unpronounceable name of Umuamua, um, a cigar-shaped 
body that uh, apparently was an icy comet that came from some other solar system. And uh, there's another one whose, whose name I don't remember, but aside from those, what we have of, of extrasolar stuff are just little bitty micron sized grains in, in chondrite meteorites. And it would be really, really neat to see what stuff from outside our solar system is like. I, that, that would be my favorite. Awesome, thank you. And uh, yeah, can you put Don Jeff on <laughs> online? I think he'll, yeah. he'll better Jeff, give uh, Jeff, you've got you've got uh, a comment as well. I'm going to go ahead and and add your uh, microphone if you would like to say something. Um, and uh, while you're unmuting, yeah, please. Oh, I was just adding that L cross did detect um, a trace amount of ammonia on the I don't know six percent level um, out of the whole volatile that they detected in the plume that was ejected from L-Cross. So there is a little bit of ammonia there. It's a little bit of ammonia at the south pole the of the moon. moon. Yep. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Thank you. Um, there was uh, there was uh, another question. Um, well, first of all, um, for um, one of our attendees wants to know about certificates for participants. Uh, participants, if you would email me afterwards, I can send you a certificate of participation if you would like one, absolutely. So email me afterwards and I can arrange for that. And what I'll probably do for the future ones is have a link after the, after the event where it'll bring up a certificate for you, but I haven't arranged that, so just email me. And then um, there was a question, um, any possibility that Pluto might be recommissioned as a planet since New Horizons flew past it? Anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> I, vo I vote yes. It's not up to me, but I would vote yes. I mean, doesn't it still have to meet the, the three criteria in order for it to get its status back? Yeah, that's what I thought as well. It does. It's I mean, still cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess the uh, big question is whether or not they rework the requirements either which way. Uh, the two, I guess, somewhat proposed new criteria that I've seen are either one which basically makes anything large enough to be round but small enough not to have ever undergone fusion to be a planet. So that would include all the round things in our solar system. So it'd be like 300 planets. Uh, including our own moon um, and every moon down to the size of about 400 kilometers across. And then the other definition I've seen uh, has been put forth by uh, Jean-Luc Margot uh, that is based off the mass of the star at the center of whatever solar system it is and how far it is from its radius. And that defines something known as the hill radius and that basically gives the gravitational influence of the planet. And then it basically is just a more mathematical way of saying the orbit clearing criterion, except now you have this equation that tells you if your planet is big enough to do such a thing. And if you apply that to our solar system, the eight current planets do fulfill that requirement. If you apply it to every currently observed exoplanet, they all fulfill that. So that's basically the two, I think, currently competing things and one might be liked more by astronomers and one might be liked more by some geophysicists and planetary scientists um, just for further context for people. Uh, I assume most people are just following their heart though. Yeah, well said. <laughs> I think the definition is just so loosely constrained that it's like different but like just so you guys know in planetary community we call everything planetary body including moon so mm. you know we do not differentiate guys yeah. <laughs> so um i see that uh, people have commented on this and some of you are voting no and some of you are voted yes and want to change the criteria um and uh and comments about Pluto's orbit and how long it takes for it to go around the sun. Um, someone commented that uh, if, if Pluto, um, uh, because it takes 248 years to complete a revolution, that that would affect it. But if there was a really, really big planet out there that took 300 years to orbit, it would still be a planet, yes or no? <laughs> if it somehow managed to go in between the 
in between the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud somehow. <laughs> as long as it clears its orbit, I guess. Yeah, as long as it orbits around the uh, sun. Yeah. yeah. And is round. Yeah. I just yeah. and I think as long as its orbits following a was it has to follow a specific plane as well around a star. I, don't know I can't remember it having to be uh so most planets do follow in the same plane uh, called the ecliptic, but I don't think that's part of the definition. Uh, no, no, I don't think it is. I don't think it Dick is. Mache okay, I wasn't sure if it... three parts the orbit the sun, which I think is con the stupidest mm -hmm. one, actually, not the clearing <laughs> orbit. Clearing orbit, I'm okay with. Orbiting the sun means there's only eight planets in the entire universe. Yeah. Uh, well, we just haven't <laughs> defined planets for other stars yet, that's all. <laughs> so, anyway. And then, yeah, it, it has to be in an elliptical orbit. Um, but I don't it think has it has to, to be in the same plane. Gravitationally, okay. it has to be, uh, the, the, the common speak is it has to be round. No dog bone shaped planets. Um, yep, J thank you, Jeff. Yeah, large enough to be round. Orbit the sun and cleared its orbit. Well, folks, our time is up. Um, I, um, Cheryl, can you please go ahead and share some of our final slides? And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and, and pull up one last poll. And this one um, is uh, just for our attendees, not for our panelists. Um, I'd like to know a little bit from you about your thoughts about tonight. Um, and uh, we'd love to get your input because it will help us. There are also um, other sessions coming up on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. So I do hope that you will join us uh, for other nights as well. Come back, we'll have other speakers. Uh, and yes, uh, Richard, I agree. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. We're delighted that all of you were able to join us. Um, and, and I invite all of our participants to, to uh, all of our attendees to join me in thanking all of tonight's speakers, panelists, and, uh, and we look forward to hearing more in the next few nights. So um, I'm going to end the polling in about 15 more seconds, give everyone a chance to make up their minds here, but we'd love your feedback and we do hope to see you again soon. Five, four, Three, two, one. Cheryl, can you go ahead and forward to the next slide? I think we had one or two other ones that may not be important. Um, yeah. Uh, so please, if you want more information about Live from LPSC, we have an article with all the details. And uh, we, uh, including the list of who's speaking on which night. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna end polling now. And uh, we are done. Thank you, every everyone. We really, really appreciate it. <laughs>